The history of the Wild West is full of myths and stereotypes, but the truth about justice in the West is often more complicated and more unsettling. There was more violence plaguing the American West than the body count in a Clint Eastwood movie, and people pouring into the frontier searching for new lives and communities had to handle the law on their own. But because of the area's limited resources and extreme isolation, due process was frequently a far cry from the grim yet noble law and order portrayed in Western movies. So today we're taking a look at how justice in the Wild West was worse than you think. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and leave us a comment to let us know what other tumultuous periods of history you would like to hear about next. Okay, I'm a cowboy on a steel horse I ride. The American West stirs up grand images from movies, daring escapes, shootouts at high noon, and Will Smith rapping in a blinding white three-piece suit. But the reality was less heroic. Homicide rates in the West were high, rivaled only by the violence of the American South during the Civil War and Reconstruction. An adult living in Dodge City, Kansas from 1876 to 1885 stood a 1 in 61 chance of getting whacked, or roughly 1.5%. That may not sound too high, but for comparison, the average chance of becoming a homicide victim in the United States in 2015 was 1 in 200. No wonder everyone in old photos looks so worried. Things were a little more relaxed in San Francisco. From 1850 to 1865, a San Franciscan had a 1 in 203 chance of meeting an early end. Meanwhile, a resident of modern-day San Francisco has a 1 in 203 chance of working at a crappy.com. In addition to the frontier conditions, the Civil War worsened the violence of the Wild West. After the war, many men were left with nothing except the gun handling skills they had practiced in the military. These former soldiers headed west to seek opportunity, leading to an era in which arguments were solved largely with bullets. The Civil War also left animosity between the soldiers who fought with the Union and those who fought for the Confederacy. Such was the case with Wild Bill Hickok, a former Union soldier, and Dave Tut, a former Confederate, who ended their rivalry in a shootout that left Tut dead. Working with weak political organization and limited resources, many Western cities were unprepared to handle high crime rates. Los Angeles County, with a population of approximately 6,000, made up of mostly young single men, had a higher homicide rate than New York City. The county also had a high rate of assault and other violent offenses. In the face of the sheer number of crimes, the legal system had difficulty keeping up, and many simply went unpunished. One potential settler said, This place will not do for me. There is no security here. I dare not venture out after the dark of night has set in. Oh, yeah, that sounds like Los Angeles. When a story attracted public anger, some settlers in the West were quick to take the law into their own hands. These vigilantes were idealized in popular contemporary accounts, but the justice they exacted was often brutal. Not content with apprehension and execution, some vigilantes physically abused the accused. Some even took trophies. In 1891, the skin of a hanged bandit was tanned and made into souvenirs. You know, in case you wanted a belt or some drapes covered in bullet holes and misspelled tattoos. Vigilantes justified this kind of brutality by pointing to the terrible acts the accused had allegedly committed. You definitely would not want to have been accused of any crimes in the Wild West. The life expectancy of someone who broke the law often decreased dramatically after conviction, especially for those accused of taking another person's life. Whether offenders received an official trial or one carried out by unsanctioned vigilantes, Western justice demanded blood. In California, offenders were convicted in quick trials and hanged at the county courthouse. Maxecution usually came shortly after the conviction as appeals weren't something the townspeople had a lot of patience for. If an expected execution didn't happen, or didn't happen quickly enough for the crowd, vigilantes might take matters into their own hands. Well, it's not like they had TV. The West was pretty dull back then. In one 1851 case, vigilantes convicted a man of stealing gold dust and gave him a mere three hours to get his affairs in order before his hanging. That's barely enough time to spend your gold dust. Even when the accused were caught and awaiting trial, vigilante squads did not always have the patience to wait for a legal sentence or risk an acquittal. Instead, they showed up at the jail and demanded to deal with the offenders themselves. In 1878, an accused killer was caught and taken to jail, with a trial scheduled for the following day. 
But during the night, 20 or 30 masked men arrived with guns in hand to skip completely over that pesky trial portion of the justice system and hanged him immediately. Vigilante justice is inherently subject to the whims and biases of the public, and historically those biases are often influenced by racism. The West was no exception. Indigenous, Hispanic, and Chinese Americans were frequent targets of vigilante acts in California. For example, an incident in 1878, Native American Juan La Cruz was accused of attacking a woman and child while drunk. The woman and her child were unharmed, but a mob seized the accused attacker from jail anyway, and La Cruz was later found hanging in the woods. The Wild West also saw the rise of the Pinkerton Detectives, a private agency commonly hired as bounty hunters for the most troublesome offenders. There are also the guys who failed to protect President Lincoln at Ford's Theater. Guess they forgot to do pat-downs that night. If only they'd hired an Atlanta bouncer. The Pinkertons infiltrated the Reno crew after their infamous train heist and worked to bring down Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch. But despite their fearsome reputation, the famed outlaw Jesse James continued to elude them. As he kept dodging their advance like a game of whack-a-mole, the Pinkertons grew more desperate to catch him. And desperation plus guns and a steady diet of whiskey never ends well for innocent bystanders. During a raid on James's mother's house in 1875, one of the Pinkertons chucked a bomb through the window, detonating James's eight-year-old half-brother and partially removing his mother's arm. James wasn't even at the house. He'd been tipped off and had already fled by the time the Pinkertons arrived. The general public was so horrified by the Pinkertons' reckless actions that they were forced to give up their chase, and James was ultimately gunned down by a member of his own gang. They made a pretty damn good movie about it. San Francisco, California was a gold rush boom town with a rapidly increasing population, and that boom brought a sharp uptick in violent offenses. Tired of the ineffectual justice system, San Franciscans rolled up their sleeves and formed a vigilance committee in 1851 with around 200 members. During their time in action, they hanged many offenders and deported several others. As conditions improved, the committee disbanded. But in 1856, Irish Catholic politician James Casey fatally shot a newspaper editor who had accused him of involvement in illegal activity. In response, outraged San Franciscans formed a second vigilance committee. In other words, a vigilance committee for the vigilance committee. Ah, the seeds of bureaucracy. Casey had already been arrested by law enforcement, but 500 men from the committee surrounded the jail and demanded Casey. The vigilantes put Casey through a brief trial and hanged him. Kinda feels like that trial might have been for show. I know, we need a third vigilance committee. As with much vigilante justice, this incident had more to do with their personal biases than with law and order. The vigilantes were mostly American Protestants, who had lost political power to recently immigrated Irish Catholics like Casey. The West had many problems with vigilante justice, but the legitimate lawmen were often not much better. Many law enforcement officers were not consistently paid, earning money only by taking a percentage of fines or collecting bounties on wanted men, or by turning to crime themselves. Sheriff David Allison was accused several times of misappropriation of money. Henry Newton Brown was a deputy sheriff tasked with tracking people for a bounty, but on his bounty hunt, Brown robbed a bank with three accomplices. Well, maybe he misunderstood the bounty. Wanted bank robber could be a little misleading. Timothy, long-haired Jim, Courtright, used his position in law enforcement to run a protection racket that extorted profits from gambling dens and saloons. Courtright tried to muscle in on a saloon owner named Luke Short, who perforated long-haired Jim in a duel. That said, there were legitimate peace officers in the West, ranging from town sheriffs and marshals to the U.S. Marshals appointed by the Attorney General. U.S. Marshals were charged with maintaining federal law, and they could deputize local men to form a posse when greater numbers were necessary. But there was an understanding that if you joined the crew, your life expectancy got real low. The U.S. Marshals alone racked up a significant amount of on-the-clock deaths. In 1872, a marshal and seven members of his posse were fatally shot when they tried to take a prisoner from the custody of a Cherokee court. A prisoner escaped claimed the lives of a deputy marshal and two posse members in 1887. Another did the same to two deputy marshals and one posse member in a 1893 shootout, beginning to see why the Pinkertons resorted to blindly hucking explosives through a window. The Old West still holds records for the deadliest incidents involving multiple law enforcement casualties, which is a dubious trophy, but a trophy nonetheless. 
The Old West had no shortage of guns, creating a bad situation for lawmen trying to prevent violent offenses. Most cities in the West had a simple solution, gun control. Towns like Tombstone, Arizona and Dodge City, Kansas required visitors to surrender their guns when they entered the town. But that was easier said than done, so gun control really just amounted to shooting anyone who refused to disarm themselves. In fact, the 1881 shootout at the OK Corral started as a conflict over Billy Clanton and the McClary brothers refusing to give up their guns when they entered Tombstone. Anyone defying a western town's gun control laws was likely to meet a violent end. Author and cowboy Andy Adams described the gun laws of Dodge City in his account published in 1903. The buffalo hunters and rangemen have protested against the iron rule of Dodge's peace officers, and nearly every protest has cost human life. Don't ever get the impression that you can ride your horses into a saloon or shoot out the lights in Dodge. It may go somewhere else, but it don't go there. Geez. An old west town where you can't crash your horse into a bar and blast all the streetlights out isn't a town worth visiting. Nah, I thought this was the Wild West. So what do you think? Could you have survived the Wild West? Tell us why or why not in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.